Hello and welcome to the Outcast. I'm your host, HC, and with me is Wolf. And today we have a very special guest with us. He is an author, and his new book um, is being released relatively soon. So we are here to ask him some questions. Introduce yourself, good sir. Yeah, hi. I'm October, uh, October K. Santarelli, and like you said, I am an author. My book comes out on February 23rd. Uh, it's the first book in my new series, the Nightfall series. It's called City of Day. Mm, very exciting. So to, so to those who don't know you, please tell us a bit about yourself. You said you're an author, but uh, what, other, what other things have you done? What, uh, what people should look out for besides the new book? Yeah, so I write books and comics. Uh, I have some work on Webtoon that I am going to be releasing hopefully later this year. Um, I have written a science fiction book, a young adult science fiction book with author David Brin called Storm's Eye. And I have a short story published in an anthology called Mia Kupo, um, which is about Leonardo da Vinci and his boyfriend. It's really cute. I also work as a sensitivity reader for my quote unquote day job, um, which is where I read other people's manuscripts and give them feedback on LGBTQ plus characters. That's really cool. Uh, is there anything, is there any one that you went over that you can talk about, like, um, or is it under wraps yet? Like, books that I've read? Yeah, like uh, so something that um, that you know it's out already, something that people can go and check because that sounds really interesting. Yeah, one of my favorite series that I've read for is called Wright's Wrath, W R I G H T. Um, and it's an urban fantasy book by author Kevin Davis, featuring mm -hmm. a really cool, like, urban fantasy sci-fi concept. Like, it's both at the same time, which is awesome. And uh, a non-binary best friend. All right. That's really cool. So now so now that everyone got to know you and what uh, else have you done, uh, Wolf, next question is yours. Oh, gosh. Here we go. We're jumping into it. Uh, yes. What got you into writing? Well, honestly, a couple teachers. Um, <laughs> when I was in third grade, I was wild. Nobody could keep me focused for the life of them. I was literally the worst person to have in your class. Um, and then I got this teacher, Mr. Todd, and he gave me extra homework to keep me calm. And it worked. Uh, he gave <laughs> me extra homework looking up big words in the dictionary and so like we'd have our regular vocab list and then I'd have like two or three extra words that I had to learn each week and so I started really falling in love with words uh I didn't know you could be a writer though until seventh grade so I was an avid reader devoured books constantly but in seventh grade we did this little poetry unit and I you know turned in this little stapled paper book with crayon drawings to my teacher and when she gave it back at the end of the poetry unit, it said, A plus, this could be professional. And I don't know why, but until that point, I literally thought that everybody who had written books had like written their book and died. Like they didn't <laughs> exist anymore. Yeah, I was like, books are just new to me. They're not actually new. Um, so I went up to her after class and I was like, what do you mean that like, this could be professional? And she's like, like you could be a writer, like there, you, you could. And I was like, that's a job. And it was over from that point. And my parents still hate her to this day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's uh, most uh, most parents who who hear their child go. I want to I want to be a creator of some kind. So. But uh, <laughs> hey, but hey, here you are. And that, that's you see, kids, do your homework. That's the lesson <laughs> of today's episode. Yeah, oh, you might, might find out. More, yeah, you might find out you have a secret talent and weird love of words. All right, so so now, like you said, you you wrote uh, books, novels, you wrote comics. Uh, so what what would you say the difference is between each medium, and what do you like and dislike about each each one? Like, what are the differences, and what do you prefer? Well, when you're writing comics. Um, you don't have the end in mind because you don't know how long it's going to go. You just kind of, you know, you've got rough ideas of where you want to go. So it's like, 
I need to get to this point by the end of this arc. And then I think maybe I'll do this for the next arc, but you don't have a definitive end. Um, especially if your comic gets popular, you're not supposed to end. So it's really, yeah. it's really more serially written. Whereas with a trilogy or a standalone novel, I know where the end is and I'm working towards it the whole time. So mm -hmm. that's the biggest difference. I mean, apart from novels also having 8 million times more words, because when you're scripting comics, you have to keep it short and sweet. Mm -hmm. So so the main difference basically is that with a novel, you usually have a clear idea where to go. With comics, you can have an idea of what you want to do, but you let the process guide you. And if you get popular, it just keeps going and going until... Until, until you just something. run out. Until yeah. you run out of story and then you're like, well, I'm tapped. You know, I, I don't they, know. <laughs> or they reboot you and it keeps going for millenniums until someone makes a movie about them and now they're even more popular. <laughs> you know, happens to everyone. So, you know, but um, interesting prospect on both processes. So which one would you say you prefer or what do you prefer about one over the other? Uh, with comics, I like the visual aspect of it a lot. Like when I'm scripting, um, I write text and then a rough idea of what the character's doing. And I like seeing somebody take like literally a sentence, maybe two, and turn it into a couple of panels in a comic. So that's really neat because I'm really vague. Um, and then with novels, that's where I started. That's kind of where my heart lies. I've got a million books I want to write. So when i when i'm working on novels it's like it's like painting a whole picture by myself mm -hmm. and uh, that's kind of an improv question because i found it interesting how when you write a comic you said that you're pretty vague when writing it and then see what the artists come up with how much are you involved with the process of actually putting this to into art I am currently part of a writer's room, so I am one of a number of writers, and then we cycle writing uh, episodes. We wrote the first six or seven together um, so that we could all get a feel for what the story was, and then we're going off from there. Now, I meant um, more when it comes to actually, pens uh, actually drawing the comic. You said that you're very vague with your description. And then you see how the artists, you know, turn it into several panels or one panel. How how involved are you in actually seeing the art coming together? I am not involved in the art coming together. I'm just a okay. writer for this comic, and the main creator is an artist, so he gets all the all the. Okay. Uh, I was just wondering if there are like any input you give in while they're drawing it, or you just wait to see the final result, and it's yeah. new to you. Yeah, okay. I, like, I like the final result. It's always a surprise. Mm -hmm. Well, um, it's it's nice to be surprised by something you wrote. That's that's a great feeling. Um, Wolf, next question. Yeah, how would you describe your style? Okay, so I had to Google this guy, but I have been compared to this man named Harlan Ellison. Um, he was a big science fiction writer. And he, like, he wrote, I, Robot, and I Have No Mouth, But I Must Scream, both of mm. which are really neat titles. Um, and apparently, he wrote weird enough that he changed the science fiction genre. So apparently, I write weird. That's my style. Um, I think that I write, like, poetry meets prose. I like weaving everything together and making it have this kind of rhythm when you read it in your head. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. And I will and I will add weird is good. Embrace yeah. the weird. Mm -hmm. Embrace <laughs> yeah. all the weird. So, I am, so that's very cool. Yeah, I've been told that I am distinctive to say the least. I've I've had people be like I've you know, it's really unique, it's really weird, it's different, and I'm like, okay, good, so you all agree on least on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, agreeing on weird is usually good, because that means it's it's supposed to be weird, it's not like weird unintentionally, because I've come across those. 
Oh yeah. <laughs> All right. So, uh, next question is: What's your biggest challenge when you write, and how do you usually overcome it? Okay. So the biggest challenge for me is actually that I have ADHD, and trying to the club. <laughs> right, trying to finish a hundred thousand word novel when you have ADHD, and then do it again because you can't just do it once. Um, That's the okay, hardest now, part. Now you're just attacking me. Now you're just attacking me. <laughs> But yeah, relating, yes. Um, so I actually was doing all right with it, going to cafes and stuff. But then there was a plague. Um, mm. And everything that I knew how to do, I couldn't do it anymore because I was stuck in my house all the time. So I started running experiments on me and my friend. Um, <laughs> And using a lot of science research, like I did so much research on what ADHD was um, during 2020, and then started giving all of us things to try. So I came up with ways to make it easier for us. Um, and that helped a lot. Things like doing writing sprints. So writing for only 15 to 30 minutes at a time, set a timer, and then reset a timer, and then... Um, hyper focus If for that little bit of time your brain likes that a lot better uh body doubling by writing in voice chats or zoom calls and a lot of that music ritual you know set up the same playlist so that every time you write you can turn on that playlist and your brain goes ah we're writing light a candle the same candle so your brain goes ah we're writing you know stuff like that so i took yeah. every little trick i could and now i finish books again all right that's really cool i'll i'll have to try some of those that <laughs> never try the candle music somewhat never try the candle that I, that sounds really interesting I'll i use try. the i yeah, use the yeah. chronicles of narnia soundtracks so why like, did you have to give the one movie i don't like and everyone else loves <laughs> well the soundtracks are good they are okay very good fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> all right anyway uh, wolf next question yeah what is your favorite topic or genre to write about so i write a lot of fantasy um and in fantasy what i really like to explore are thinly veiled queer tropes so i am an lgbtq plus author and what i write about is things like found family which is you know something that had i've gone through you know had to find my own family for a while um mm -hmm. found family um alienation feeling like you don't quite fit in feeling like something's weird about you um you know difficulty to connect with other people i like writing about themes that queer people experience in language that everyone else can understand mm -hmm. uh, all right a, a little bit off topic i'm gonna ask a question you, you like you you know you say you gravitate towards fantasy like uh what why you know um gosh i'm great at english i promise you you know i'm good with words maybe <laughs> is what, the what? american for the record <laughs> Shh, don't tell them that i <laughs> i am uh I, i'm curious to see like you know what what makes you gravitate towards fantasy when it comes to writing those types of themes and everything i think a lot of it has to do with what i've read growing up i mm -hmm read almost exclusively fantasy and it was such a good escape for me from like yeah. everything else and it was transportive and i really liked that aspect of it and i like the idea of magic so i i you know i don't know I'm, yeah it's like i'm like seven years old and i'm like wow i really wish magic were real Agreed. um so <laughs> so now i'm <laughs> so Except for I never stopped thinking that. So, Still so now I write about it. <laughs> Again, who doesn't? Like, <laughs> magic would be cool to have around. Oh, gosh, it would be so cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, so uh, just uh, that's, again, kind of an off-the-cuff question here, eh? because you mentioned you really enjoy writing fantasy and you're also LGBTQ themes and, you know, In this current world where we we have shows like She-Ra and the Princess of Power, the Owl House, and stuff like that, which are fantasy shows and they have those elements in them. Um, do you ever look at something like this and you say, 
uh, and you, you say like, this is an idea I would have done, or this is something that we can keep growing from there. Like in, in, now that we actually live in a world where both, both of those things kind of coincide with each other, what, what I'm interested to know what's your take on it as a writer? Like, where do you think this can evolve? I think as things move forward, representation is becoming easier. Like they just, you just put queer characters in things and you don't make a big deal out of the fact that they're queer. And I really like that. Um, as we move forward, I think it's going to happen more and more because more and more of the population is identifying as some type of LGBTQ+. Um, it's it's a ridiculous number. It's something like 35 Forty percent of the population at this point um, identifies, like yeah, as pan or bi or like not all the way down to gay and trans, but they all identify as at least bi. Like bi has become yeah. really big and popular, and yeah, people Under are embracing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah. it's like I don't know the exact statistics, but I think it was in the thirties somewhere, thirty percent. Um, last time I found an article about it. So I think as it goes on, we're just going to get better about not caring, if that makes sense. Because it, it doesn't, like, it matters right now that we put representation in things because there isn't any. But it doesn't actually need to matter. When we get to the point where it doesn't matter, like, it doesn't matter if there is a married heterosexual couple in a TV show. It doesn't matter. That's just what happens, you put those in TV shows. So when it gets to the point where it doesn't matter that there are queer characters in television, that's where I want to get. Mm -hmm. uh, completely agree for the record. And to some extent, and to some extent, we are kind of there because the shows don't make a big deal out of it. It's the perception that does. So yep. maybe, maybe also make it just, <laughs> it, you know, it's a, you just wait for this moment where it, it won't be like suddenly such a big deal that there is, uh, you know, that there is something like this. So it's a just, it will just happen and everyone will know, yeah, sure, that's fine. Exactly. That's where I want to get. All right. And who knows? I'm crossing fingers that one day you'll write one of those shows. Here's That'd be awesome. One. I would be cool with that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, gi give, a, give us a He-Man reboot or something. I don't know. That'd be fun. That's the fun. That's the first thing that came to mind. <laughs> so anyway, talking, so as we mentioned, you have a new book releasing really soon called City of Day. Um, so tell us a bit about it since it's uh, just coming out and what do you want people to know without spoiling it, of course? Yeah, it is a book about murder ghosts. Um, there's this island kingdom called Astera and every night when the sun sets, murderous ghosts called the vine like pop out of the ground and kill anybody who's left on shore so everybody sleeps on boats at night and then comes back ashore to like work and live during the day and it's been this way for as long as anyone can remember like generations back a couple hundred years you know um mm -hmm. and so it's perfectly normal to them everybody else outside the country is like are you guys okay um but for them, it's normal. And what happens is a thief named Thistlin gets stuck on the island at night. Like the sun is setting and there's no boats. And he's like, this is probably bad. <laughs> and that's where we start. That's actually where we start in chapter one is Thistlin is stuck on the island and the sun is setting and there's murder ghosts. I like that premise. That's cool. Yeah, I'm picking this up. <laughs> yeah, whenever it's out, like uh, it has thieves, it has ghosts, and it has not just and ghosts and murder see. ghosts. So, yeah, there you go. No, so, it's like, like I love that premise. Need, That's really cool. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, this is the first time we're hearing this, by the way, people. So, like, hey, yeah, man, where do I get a copy? Link me, <laughs> link you, or I can <laughs> order this or something. So, yeah, but uh, that's for a bit later, Wolf. What, yeah. uh, what inspired you to write this one? Sinbad. Oh, interesting. <laughs> yeah, so I have an antique copy of the Sinbad stories, and I was reading through it. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I just have to ask this question just to get the joke out of my chest. Who is Brad Pitt in this story? 
<laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh, okay. Fair enough. I missed uh, this joke. <laughs> uh, so in, uh, in the Sinbad movie, DreamWorks made like years ago, Sinbad is voiced by Brad Pitt. If you haven't seen it, I'll recommend it. It's actually really good. I love that movie. I just didn't know that was Brad Pitt. Now I love it even more. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, glad to be of assistance. So yeah. So yes. Anyway, got this out of the way. Please continue. So Sinbad. yeah, Sinbad. Um, I was reading it, and there is this one Sinbad story where he gets stuck on a jungle island, and everybody sleeps on boats at night because if they don't gorillas will come out of the jungle and kill them. And I was like, that's a really interesting premise, but probably not with gorillas. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> so, so, just, I just have to say, somebody saw the red cows and it's like, you know, it would be cool, put Sinbad in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Um, so the premise that I went with was everybody has to sleep on boats at night. And I really had to do a lot of thinking and world building off of just that concept as to why and that created the world and then i just put a couple of players in that scene um and went from there actually the first time i wrote it i wrote it with the wrong main character so that was fun there's a <laughs> there's a secondary point of view character named mila um and it's kind of her story and thislin's story and mm -hmm. Mila was interesting, but Thislin was more interesting, and I wrote him as a side character the first time. So I had to go back and completely rewrite the book with Thislin uh, and Mila as main characters. So, so basically, just to kind of compare it to something, so you basically had a frozen moment where in the end it's like, wait, yeah, wait, I have something. Okay, time to rewrite the whole thing. <laughs> yep. Uh, um, do you also have a song that everyone is gonna sing and be sick of it? Let it go. <laughs> uh, I'm, taking, I'm taking it as a yes. Okay, confirm. Song in the book. Let's go. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. So, but uh, so far, do you have any other anything else that inspired the book, or is it is that it? Is that um, is it Sinbad uh, when he was stuck in the jungle? Yep, Sinbad when he or Sinbad Sinbad when he was stuck in yeah. the jungle, um, and that's. You know, I like doing that a lot. I like when I'm reading and I'm like, huh, that one sentence, that two sentences, that little paragraph was kind of an interesting concept. And I like taking those concepts and then spinning them into something else. Yeah, like that's always something that's fun when you read a book or see a movie or a show or something. And you're like, you know something? This is an interesting concept. Why not try and develop that? Why not do something with this aspect of it? And so yeah, that's really cool. That's really cool that you can take something and turn it into its own thing. And also yeah. outside of the original. That's awesome. I do it with a lot of like, I, I have a lot of fairy tale collections and myth collections and Sinbad Counts is one of those. And I'll go through those and I'll look for inspiration, including like stories like, I don't know if you guys have heard about the Turnip Princess. It's like a bunch of fairy tales that never made it into the mainstream. Those ones are super it's fascinating. So it sounds familiar, but I can't like pinpoint something in uh, something in particular. I've heard of it. All right. So, um, so uh, next one is how um, uh, how personal would you say this uh, book is compared to the other stuff you've done? This one has been. Like, there's always going to be a special place for your first book, you know? Um, I started writing this book in 2018. Mm -hmm. And I, this was before I knew as much as I knew. This is before I was published. This is before I even had a twinkle of a published book in my eye. Um, and it was, you know, a very long process. I wrote it wrong. I had to go back. I had to completely redo the outline, I had to rewrite it, and then I had to edit it, and then I had to rewrite it again. And, and you know, it was a really long process, especially with not writing for half of 2020, half or more. Um, and so this book will always be personal to me because it's the first, it's the one that taught me the most, it's the only one I will ever have that much time for again. Um, so... I made sure to take my time with it and and give it my full attention. 
Uh, well, fun and also, yeah. That's bring, fine. Bringing that's that up, I have, a, I have a question for you. If there's like one thing you know now that if you could go back and tell yourself, what would that be from like that experience, from all the experience you've had from writing this book? When it's not working, go back to the outline faster. <laughs> um, I I got through an entire draft before I was like, well, yeah, I was right. That did not work. Um, and I could have stopped so much earlier and I didn't <laughs> because I was like, I have to finish it before I can fix it. No, sometimes when you get stuck, go back to the outline and try again faster. That's what I did working on book two. Um, I'm just now wrapping up book two. And I was having trouble with it and was like, I'm going to go and look at the outline. I'm going to go look at the outline right now, even though I am 40,000 words into this draft. And I went and I looked and I was like, I'm right. I am wrong. So I had to go back and start over. And I did that sooner and it worked much better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess so does this, but is there anything you would tell like a very young, a very younger version of you, like you know, when you found out you can do this for a walk, what would you what would you tell that version of you now that you have the experience? If writing is what you want to do, don't get distracted, because <laughs> everybody was like, "Oh, you can't make money with that," and I was like, "Oh, okay, you're probably right," and so I went to college for something else. I mean, I double majored in creative writing and something else, but I went to college focusing on something else. And then I went and uh, I became a professional cosplayer because I was like, well, this might make me money and I'm good at sewing. And I didn't write because I was so busy with all the sewing. And it took me a long time to get to the point where I was like, you know, what I like to do is right. You know, what I want to do long term is right. And I wasted, not necessarily wasted, there was a lot of life lessons learned that it probably make me a better writer and a better human being. But I, I wasted those years I could have been writing, getting distracted with everything else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, um, that's in a, I mean, I think everyone who's trying to get into creative and to a creative career goes through this. So it's, a, it's nice and also reassuring to know that Everyone goes through this and everyone oh, yeah. manages to find their way. Yep. If you're meant to do it, it'll bother you until you do it. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> so anyway, so Child of Light, uh, City of Day. Why did I call it Child of Light? <laughs> but the uh, City of Day is, you know, almost here. Uh, so yep. what is your expectation from the book and the reaction for it? Like, are you expecting any kind of uh, audience to respond to it? Uh, what What are your thoughts regarding how it's going to be perceived? Uh, I am a little bit cheating right now. Because mm -hmm. I've sent out something called ARC copies. So it's advanced okay. reader copies. Um, mm -hmm. And people have already been giving me their reviews back. So I've cheated a little bit. I know how the audience is taking it. Uh, okay. <laughs> but, well, but you know, that's the, the you know, wider audience. People... Yeah. <laughs> um, I expect the wider audience to be surprised. Um, I hope that people can't see what I think are kind of blatant things. Like I put them in the manuscript and it's like, oh, everybody's going to get this. I really hope they don't. Um, I really hope they're as surprised as I want my readers to be when they read this book. I want them to be, you know, taken on this twisting, turning path. Um, I would love it if it was just creepy enough, just unsettling enough uh, to keep you on the edge of your seat the whole time. And that's the ghosts. The ghosts need to keep you on your seat the, the whole time. Um, mm -hmm. The reactions that I've already gotten from it have been ridiculously positive and very cool uh one person compared it to the horror elements of netflix's castlevania meets the fantasy world building of diana Wynne jones in howl's moving castle Ooh, huh interesting yeah i was like you know, i think you should have been an advertiser because this is <laughs> selling on the book mall <laughs> Oh yeah, no, I was so excited about that one. And then another one of my reviews says that uh, I 
throw them in directly into the action from page one and keep them on the edge of their seat until the final page. And the plot is a fresh take on tropes that fantasy readers know and love. Mm -hmm. Well, sounds like you're doing it. Um, uh, th so this is an improvised question. I was just thinking about it. Um, you know, obviously, the, you wrote comics. You wrote other stuff before, as we established. Um, was there ever, like, any fan feedback that stuck with you? Like, something that you read, either positively or negatively, if you want to um, if you want to show, like, something that stuck with you? Well, the good news is that nobody's given me a negative review to my face yet, so <laughs> I'm sure they exist, but I haven't seen them. Um, I think what stuck to me the most, actually, was in my previous works, people tell me that I'm really good at character. Um, I don't think that I'm really good at writing character. I think that's where I struggle the most. So it's always really interesting to me to have somebody come up and be like, your character building is so like in depth and so strong. And that's what I'm getting from this book as well as from Storm's Eye, the first book that I wrote. Um, well, the first book that I published, not the first one I wrote. Mm -hmm. yeah. And and the, like, that's the consistent feedback that I get back from people is that I'm really good at driving, you know, stories with character. And I was like, that is a very high compliment and something I never thought I would achieve. Um, so that's, you know, that's been a surprise. All right, cool. So, the, so far it's um, kind of been in your career. So now we're for some, you know, fun, fun questions. Wolf, take the first one. Favorite book? My favorite book of all time. Nope, I'm going to do my favorite book right now. I can't quantify, like, all time. Uh, <laughs> I'm one of those people Fair. who has a lot of favorite books. I've got a top yeah. ten list. But my favorite one right now um, is actually a book called uh, In Deeper Waters by F.T. Lukens. And it is a queer retelling of The Little Mermaid. Um, it's a Why YA book. I heard about it. I it's... It's May, so I think I think I think a friend of mine told me about it. I'm not entirely sure. It sounds familiar, but okay. Yeah, it's it's a really cute take on the Little Mermaid with two male characters, and there is a thinly veiled queer trope, which I really like. Like being gay in this universe is perfectly well accepted, but the queer trope that they still explored was being the only person in your family who is different. Um, and I, I was the first, the oldest, and the only queer person in my family. So it was, it, it really hit home for me. I loved that aspect of it. And um, on that note, please tell me it's not the version where they, where she dies that it's uh, taken inspiration from. I will not give you any spoilers. <laughs> oh, you will have enough. to read the book. <laughs> uh, so I'm taking it as, yes, it is taken from the original, but okay, I'll, I'll look into it. Um, so on that note, um, do you have a favorite author? Not just a book, just a, an author in particular. Now for that one, I do have a single answer. Um, <laughs> my favorite author is Mercedes Lackey, and she's been a fantasy author for like 30 years. 35 years she just won a science fiction fantasy writers association lifetime achievement award um she's written a couple like 150 some odd fantasy books over her 30 years she's crazy and uh i love her and she's written two of my favorite series she's got a magic horse book series uh that doesn't feel like a magic horse book series. You know, when you were a kid and there were all those horse girl books. Um, the Valdemar series is different. It's like the horses aren't as important as what they do. And so it makes it a really interesting and really fun um, series. I love that series. It's Valdemar. Um, the one I started with was Take a Thief, which is a standalone. And then she also wrote one of the coolest dragon series I've ever read. Uh, it's called, the first book is called Joust. And it's it's like an Egyptian setting. Um, and as a kid, I don't know about you, but I went through a real long, real in-depth 
Egypt phase um, with all the myths and all of that. So having dragon riders in an Egyptian desert setting um, with multiple gods like they have, I was like, this is this is fascinating. This is really cool. Um, so that was a like I I just fell in love with so many of her books that I know she's my favorite author. Really cool. Really cool. Um, so now Wolf. Next question is yours. Yeah, you mentioned uh, cosplaying earlier, but are there any other hobbies or fun things you enjoy to do still? Yeah, I don't actually cosplay anymore. Um, hmm. I, I gave that up because it takes a lot of time. Fair. And and so does writing books um, and comics and games and all at the same time. So I, I don't have enough time to sew anymore. But now what I do instead is uh, I like to read, obviously, and I like to watercolor paint. Um, and I don't really share that with anybody. Like I, I'll do it, but I don't like post my art or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Um, I just like to do it to unwind. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's fair. Yeah, that's fun. But uh, yeah, that's fun. actually another important thing. When you did cosplay, what uh, what uh, what would you say was your favorite? Like which cosplay would you say was your peak? When did you peak with cosplay? Mm -hmm. Um. There was one point where, gosh, I guess I peaked with Anastasia, um, which but I like the Anastasia movie from Dan Bluth. Yeah, make sure. Okay. Yeah, the uh, the DreamWorks Anastasia. I did the dream sequence dress um, with the blue bow and the yellow dress. Sorry, and um, and. I won the most awards with that gown, but oh. it was also one of the simplest costumes I've ever made. So the fact that that's what I won the most awards with always gets me. Like I think, it's yeah, really it, it's always that one thing. I think my girlfriend talked to me about this not long ago. It's like it's the one thing that you put quote unquote the least effort into the one that you're proud of the least that somehow gets the most attention. Yep, that's so true. Um, the one that I feel like I did the most, like the best on construction wise was actually a pinup version of Captain America. So I made a fifties off the shoulder dress um, nice. with a corseted top and it was red and white striped. And so what I did was I took the corset pattern and I cut it up even smaller and turned those into stripes. Um, so I made a corset mm -hmm. top that was, that sounds that's cool, cool. Though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that sounds really cool. And then I, the top and the skirt were just blue, so it was it was fun. Hmm. Like people, why didn't you give him a waltz for that? That sounds awesome. Because <laughs> it's not official. It was fan art based. So mm -hmm. well, well, who cares? People get the people get a waltz for it. <laughs> but all right. So um with that said. What would you say is one thing that no one knows about you? I think... Hmm. I'm like, they'll know it now, so I have yeah, to find something tell good. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. I think what people might not know about me right off the bat is that I am a really big pet person, like an animal person. I have two dogs. Uh, my roommate has two cats, but I totally... I think I take them. Like, I steal his cat. Um, and I used to be a dog trainer and a dog groomer for show dogs. Uh, I worked oh, a lot cool. with, like, I got really involved in working with animals before I became an author. That was my day uh, job. And now I just have to ask this because I know a certain friend won't uh, leave me alone if I wouldn't. Did you ever groom or work with a husky? Yes, absolutely. I've worked with like half the dog breeds out there. Huskies are one of them. I oh, are always... they dramatic. Oh gosh, yeah. No, my uh, <laughs> my sister has two huskies now, and uh, whenever I dox it for them, they act like it's the end of the world well, for like three days. <laughs> okay, sound sounds pretty accurate from videos on the internet, which I see. <laughs> yep. All right, uh, you heard it here, folks. Huskies are, Huskies are dramatic. Our <laughs> very, <guest. laughs> so very dramatic. 
So, Wolf, next question is yours. Yeah, what would be your dream project? Whether it be like a personal thing that if you had the money and time or something that you would love to work on as a fan? Yeah. I think... I think I have two separate answers for this, like working on my own thing. Um, I've been working on a video game pitch for a while. And if I had the time and money, I would definitely pursue putting that into the world as like with me as the not soul writer, head writer. That's the term for it. Um, I'd love to be the head writer on that project and get it out the way I envision it in my head. Um, and no, I'm not going to give a whole lot of details because I'm mm -hmm. hoping that I can still get it out somehow. Um, oh, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say, oh, I'm sorry. What was that? You cut out. Yeah. Oh, I, so I just want to say, if you do a Kickstarter, do yourself a favor and do not follow KG Inafune. Okay. If you if you get it, you get it. Okay. I don't. But that's okay. <laughs> um, uh, if, and... if, uh, if you type up on YouTube Mighty Number no. 9, you'll get all the answers you need on what not to do with Kickstarter. That's... Perfect. Awesome. Um, yeah, I want to do, I, like, I'd love to do that. And then I also really want to work on uh, the Assassin's Creed franchise or the Dragon mm -hmm. Age franchise. Like, video mm -hmm. games are are something that I really want to get into writing. So all of my dream projects revolve around them right now because I am already doing comics and novels. So uh, if you can, personal favor for me, if you ever get to work on Assassin's Creed, tell Ubisoft, uh, time to bring back Rayman. Come on, we need them. <laughs> bring back the boy. Okay. <laughs> Anywho, um, so... So these are the any other dream projects or are those are those the ones uh, video game stuff? Yeah, it's it's mostly video game stuff. I would like to work on um, like my favorite author Mercedes Lackey has an anthology every year. I'd like to be invited to write in that anthology at some point someday. Mm -hmm. um, oh, some fingers. Yeah, writing in writing in the magic horse world, I'd do that in a heartbeat. It'd be fun. Um, so yeah, that's probably my my authorly dream project. <laughs> All right. So with that being said, would you say you have any inspirations that you'd like to shout out in here, or like a published others or friends that you know, someone who would you say you is stuck by you and you appreciate her support in this journey? Yes, um, she's going to be really mad that I'm doing this. My best friend, Tutu, who is very awkward and shy. She's like, I don't want anybody to perceive me. Um, so <laughs> Tutu, who I'm now telling an entire podcast audience about, is literally my biggest supporter. Um, they have been my best friend for a very long time. And every time I'm like, I'm working on writing stuff today, they're like, hi, what did you do? I want the snippets like give it to me uh, <laughs> so because she's always checking in and always like when I go and visit her she makes time for me to write even on vacation because she knows that I will write even on vacation and if we don't make time for it I'll do it at night uh, <laughs> so she makes sure that I have a couple hours to write every day and she's very good about keeping me from going overboard and being too much of a workaholic. Same with my friend Ray, who is another writer. Um, and Ray's not published yet. Ray is working on uh, a couple of contract stuff. And they are uh, also really good about checking in with me. They're really good about making sure that I'm not overworking because I have a tendency to do that. Um, published authors who I really enjoy working with, F.T. Lukens, I met at the conference. Um, that's actually how I found their books. And FT uh, is really supportive, like, on a smaller scale. Not like I check in with them every time I'm writing, but when I'm like, hey, I think I'm going to write a story like this, and I've never done this before. They're like, that's really cool. Uh, here's how, you know, I would do it. What are you thinking? And they help me talk through ideas like that. Um, and then Clark C. Rowenson, who wrote a book called The Magic System Blueprint, and he does consultations on magic systems. And he made it really scientific and like broke magic systems down into pieces without discussing like, 
details like the effects of magic or anything like that he came up with a way to quantify i guess your magic system so that you can keep track of it for an entire series um without like breaking your own rules i know that's one of the biggest problems with magic systems is sometimes you mess it all up so he came up with a way to avoid doing that with one simple little sheet of paper um and it's awesome so yeah that's really that's, by the way those uh, are friends uh, that you hang on to and never let go of <laughs> by the sounds <laughs> of them like wow. yeah, yeah there's a couple of those <laughs> um so great to have people like that uh look forward in a few years to an episode where we bring them all here to <laughs> comment to this <laughs> oh no <laughs> <laughs> i'm kidding i'm kidding <laughs> but so i guess uh wolf uh, the final question for today yeah. is yours any tips that you would definitely want to give out to those who are listening? Yeah. Um, one of my first tips is to not give up. I know it's really tempting halfway through writing your first manuscript to give up. Um, and you feel like you're stuck and it's awful. The middle of the book is always awful. Even established <laughs> authors hate writing the middle of the book. So if you get to that point and you don't want to do it anymore... Welcome to the club. Don't stop. Let it be bad. Let your first draft literally be the worst thing you've ever written. Um, and then you can fix it later. So I always write really bad first drafts on purpose because then they're out of the way. And then I can go back and I can make it better. I just have to get to the end of the story that I want to tell. Um, my other piece of advice is to try it. Every time you're like, I wonder if I should do this in my book, open another document and try it. And worst case, it doesn't work. And now, you know. <laughs> well, the, this sounds like good tips, honestly. So anything else you'd want to say to the people listening besides uh, go buy your book because it sounds good? <laughs> so. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Besides go buy my book that comes out on February 23rd at the bookstore near you. Um, <laughs> I I guess I would say if creative pursuits are something you want to do, you might not be able to do it full time now, but I'm proof that you'll be able to do it full time sometime. Well, there you go. With this positive, uh, with this positive encouragement, this was all for this episode of The Outcast. We hope you enjoyed it. Uh, go, make sure to check out October's new book, uh, which City is coming Day. out, as you said. Yeah, it's City of Day, which is coming out. Yeah. I'm excited for that. Wolf. I love the premise for it. I'm interested. You will definitely, so, as soon as it releases, see the links down below in the description <laughs> of this video. Yeah. And that's the other thing I want to say. Um, October, after we're done, you can send us all the links. We'll put them in the description for people who want to go find your previous walks. They could do that easily and comfortably. Yep. And I and I guess uh, you know to the audience listening, um, uh, please if you end up uh, checking out anything that October has written or are waiting for City of Day, let us know what you thought in the comments below and let him know too in the ways in which he's able to um, in the way in, in, that I can't English today. <laughs> <laughs> I know that feeling. The, <laughs> in the ways in which uh, you find to contact them, which October, how can people find you? Yeah, you guys can find me online at my website, octoberksantarelli.com. That's where you can also find a catalog of my work. Uh, you can find me on TikTok at OKWrites, W-R-I-T-E-S. And you can find me on Instagram at O underscore K underscore writes. Because somebody took the other one. <laughs> oh. Well, that's filling when someone underscores you, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> So, well, thank you so much for coming. It's been a pleasure, and I'm looking forward to the book. Thank and you. and to all the and to all the audience listening, thank you for listening. We'll see you next time. Until then, I was HC. I was Wolf, and I was October. And we will see you all next time. Take care. Bye bye.